I did want to go over all this session with you, see that this is why I'm here in executive order. I just had Mother of Sound Lawson, who the council and Bailey have chosen to hear and decide certain land use applications. And this morning we have an application for a variance from a reasonable use critical area regulations variance. The um, applicant, Merrill Design Group, James Merrill, good morning to you, sir. And the property owners are Terry and Eric LaVore. Uh, the purpose of the hearing is to allow me to collect information on which I will make a decision. And the information is that collected only in this hearing and today do any independent investigation, but I rely upon information, first of all, from the professional planner. We have in the room Mr. David Faber, who's been a planner with the City of Issaquah for some time now. How many years? 28 years. 28 years. Well, it's good to see you back in the hearing room. It's been some time, so welcome back to the hearing room. Uh, David Faber has done an analysis of the application and prepared a staff recommendation, and that's part of the record that we're going to rely on. I also need information from the applicant. The applicant does bear the burden of proof to show that it's consistent with the criteria for approval and would rely upon testimony from the applicant to be able to present that case. And then finally, <coughs> anyone else that is present that might have any comments or questions or concerns about the application will give an opportunity for you to present them. <coughs> and after you do so, then we'll get responses from the city and applicant. I've reviewed in advance of the hearing a number of materials that the city provided to me to help prepare for the hearing, and I've reviewed them and placed them in this binder as exhibits to be part of this record. Uh, there are 23 in number. I've labeled them the staff report as exhibit 24. I also received, and I was sitting here yesterday by the city, a comment letter from uh, Britt and Paul and that we can identify as Exhibit 25. Exhibits prior to 24 and 25 <coughs> include generally the land use application, some uh, technical information prepared by Encompass Engineering and Surveying, a geotechnical study by GeoGroup Northwest, a buffer enhancement plan, a hydraulic project approval by the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. That's way back in, in 2011. And we have affidavits of publication for this hearing uh, posted as to was also on site. Was it posted on site as well? Mm -hmm. Published and posted and <coughs> mailed. <coughs> a number of comments uh, from Terry Wolf, Annie Everhart, Jim Merrill, uh, uh, the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe, uh, Matthew Airwald, and again, Annie Everhart. Those are all part of the record along with the comment received yesterday. We also have a review under the State Environmental Policy Act. There's a checklist and then a determination of non-significance with conditions. Um, <coughs> there's some correspondence with the Department of Ecology about jurisdiction of the wetlands, and then also the publication of notice of the hearing today and a copy of the decision that I issued back in 2008. All that material then is part of this record. Those exhibits are admitted into this record. And as was mentioned as we came <coughs> onto the record today, there's cameras in the room that are recording us visually as well as uh, audibly. I think testimony then will be presented here at this large podium. Is that the intent? Or it's available if you wish. Available. Or will it be in a different format? <laughs> or from, from where you're seated is fine as well. Is that right? This is a new hearing room, so we're kind of all getting used to how to proceed here. Right. Yeah. I do like this better than the other arrangement, I must say, where it kind of had some public behind me and off to the side, and we didn't yeah. know where it was going to come from. Okay. So at least this way we can okay. all see each other. I think that's helpful. So if you're ready to proceed, uh, we do require that you present testimony under oath or affirmation, and we'll begin with Mr. Faber. Is that your, your preference, is to begin with the staff report? Raise your right hand and you'll start to tell the truth of the testimony you give today. Thank you. Well, I did review your <coughs> staff report. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Get that morning. Great. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. <coughs> we all can do that. Yeah. Read it through and make sure we keep it in sync. Make sure we pick that up on the recording. <coughs> um, 
So, Mr. Faber, as a planner reviewing this, what were the um, issues that you saw as you went through this that might have given you pause, and then how did you, I think, ask that to continue with your recommendation of approval of the conditions? Boy, that was so much. Um, <laughs> well, it's a reasonable, it, the, re, the reasoning required variance is that we have compliance with the regulations that ask for the protection of environmental district wetlands, such as streams and wetlands, and this is <coughs> wetland on the property and streams bordering it, which requires uh, significantly large buffers that prevent all development, um, any development within this property. slideshow if you'd like, but um, how many slides do you have? Uh, seven to three or something like that. <laughs> nice slides, nice slides. <coughs> nice slides. He knows my rule is ten or under. Okay, well, PowerPoint. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Otherwise, but. well, that's the rule. Otherwise, we're all kind of glazing over. But uh, would you like to have those submitted as an exhibit and go through them quickly? Sure. Okay, let's do that. We'll, we'll yeah. have the PowerPoint as exhibit 26. impact in the in the recommendation and would appear to be the last two I have a suggestion Re the rest of the neighborhood is pretty much in that and this has happened over the last 10 years you said Here's the site plan that was approved in 2008 and a similar reasoning variance process. It's, it's expired now, but it shows footprint down here of access coming out by this driveway. And at the time, the owner of this project also owned these two lots and controlled all of this. And then he grants themselves.
So that was uh, approved in 2008. staff at the time Well, whatever the reason is, it's kind of hard to accept that legally, but you included that correspondence in, in the file, and there was no challenge of the administrative determination of DOE. So we're kind of, we're, I probably shouldn't say stuck with that, but it is something that is, in your department, you determine, well, we did what we could to determine jurisdiction, and we'll accept the outcome of that, uh, that decision. Seem to just really go against the Section 314 of the Shoreline Management Act. I know you've worked on that for many years, so it's quite a departure from past decisions. But we're, we're accepting that for, for what it is, and unfortunately, now it led to further review because once you receive that, you said, "Well, I've got a different path to go." Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's why we're here. That's why we're here. Otherwise, it would have been the shoreline maintenance process. Okay, so. Now that we're here and you looked at this, I noticed in your staff report, your initial review was it doesn't qualify for the variance because of the first criteria, consistency with comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. And under the structure in Issaquah, different than some cities, if that doesn't qualify, you then go to a second level of analysis for the reasonable use. Right. So is that when your focus came more on the proposal itself area of impact, this is where the remediation got involved and said the park is used that way, maybe it can be a reduced footprint. Um, so you began to focus on that. I, I, would, I would step back a little bit and say we focused on all those issues during the shoreline variance process. The criteria for the park there are very similar uh -huh. to the criteria. The comments from the neighbors So your feeling was <coughs> you did get comments, public comments, on the variance, and then when it shifted to this reasonable use, you could include
include those same comments. That's why they're in this file here, because it wasn't a significantly different type of contribution. Okay, thank you. And then what did that, what did that review in, in, include? How did you come up with the recommendation of, for approval? How did you deal with that uh, reasonable use Let's look at that requirement because, as you know, as a professional planner, this reasonable use concept, it's emerged relatively late in the whole planning review process, dealing with some U.S. Supreme Court decisions and what constitutes reasonable use of property. And sometimes we see the phrase reasonable economic use. Do you know if your code includes that um, modifier? I'm not aware of the word economic. I don't think it's there. <laughs> some cities have that and then engage in what is an economic return. Now, it appeared to me in your review that maybe it was the applicant, that that was one of the areas they wanted to focus on, was what is economic return, even though that's not in the code. Is that how the city of Issaquah has interpreted this code, that we should get some economic value in using the land? Yes, I've tried to focus on not so much the economic, but as you said, the environmental the fact that there is economic impact. Mm -hmm. But it's not the key right. factor that you look at. Well, that strikes me as more consistent with your code because it doesn't have the modifier economic and also consistent with our own state Supreme Court. We have the U.S. Supreme Court that has a lot to say about economic. Our own state Supreme Court, uh, in a case uh, dealing with Mason County, uh, Cape Canal, Friday versus Department of Ecology, they did not look at economic used to be made of the property and get some reasonable return. And in that case, it was not the construction of a house, it was the ability to look at water and to harvest oysters and that sort of thing. So there's been quite a, a spectrum of what constitutes a reasonable use. And I take it that's how you look at it then, is not, as you said, exclusively focused on economic, that's one of the variables, but you look at other balancing methods as well. You want to give me just a little bit more of how you went about doing that? We looked at the, the site itself. Um, I walked the site a bunch, um, and the input from the accused wetland just came from the reports that identified that kind of the center of the property was maybe raised by a foot or two, um, perhaps spilled in the past. So my point is that the center of the property where the, the home was proposed was not in the highest quality. In fact, I would say it was kind of degraded wetland by the area. And I'm the person who came in and made a plan that came from what's called, I guess it's commonly called gravel. Mm -hmm. And gravel. And gravel. <laughs> it costs half the amount. Okay, so that's one factor that you considered. that's another factor you considered is can you reduce impacts to neighboring properties 
that you found you could with certain conditions. Right. Any other factors that you considered when you're looking at what's reasonable use for this property? You look at the fact that uh, what what are the re what are the uses allowed in this zone? What's allowed in the neighborhood? And how can I how can I say or say that this is a single family residential zip code? And there are homes for single family zip code. Is it single family homes or double family zip codes mm -hmm. that are similar to what's proposed here? Some are older, built before. The critical areas, wetland stream regulations came into place in the early 90s. But some homes built to the east have been built since that time and are similar size. So that was a factor, similar size or even type of construction, one story, two story, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And is that based on any review of, of building records or was it more of a eyeballing and saying, well, it looks somewhat similar? In this case, it was more eyeballing. staff report we wrote back then we went through a, an ad, analysis of the square feet and the homes right. in the around the neighborhood right and then looked at this timeline is it similar though would the outcome be it's, similar it's, it's similar the the newer homes i suspect are a little larger than those that existed 10 years ago but it seems like that's the trend newer homes are being built although i've read recently that's now reversing is that right come up and it's peaked and I don't know what what is the average home you think in uh, based on what in this neighborhood I guess you're coming up with a number or just it looks the, about the same. I've not done a specific, not so much not square right, footage. I'm not a square footage. It's qualitatively you've got a you've got bifurcation where yeah we'll get to okay. that in a minute. I yeah. need to complete this dialogue. Okay. We'll do that. okay. But thank you for listening to the questions because <laughs> I want you to get yeah. information in too. So, so, okay, so that kind of looking at size, uh, construction technique, uh, uh, driveway, did, was that, did that consider it at all? What type of driveway? Yes, um, it's a paved driveway. We did talk about what would be the benefits to being able to minimize the impervious, if that's, you know, I guess we look at that. Um, with the stormwater, the dispersion path to the west and having a curvy driveway, we thought of doing these things with wheel tracks. We would prefer the little grass down the middle on the sides, and the driveway has to be perfect and uh -huh. do that. So it didn't seem that practical in this. In this, we thought of it though. Yes, we did look at it. Okay. And the same with uh, patios, porches, that kind of thing. Uh, often, <coughs> when you look at reasonable use, some of those are in size, but here you felt it was similar to other houses in the area. That's Is that uh, your analysis of why those would be also permitted? Yes, but with the condition that the application proposes that the north side, a, a approximately 300 square foot impervious paved area, um, and the condition proposes to eliminate that. So there was some reduction in area the discussion we had is to the south there's a I think there are, there's a, a yard area there and I think a patio porch area so that there's a usable area and on the east side the north side and even the south to the west side you see the if I can step up here mm -hmm. between the walls of the home and and the footprint the, the yard area is just that little Okay, kind of the so dotted area is yeah. native. It just how wide approximately would that area be on the east? Five, five feet, six feet. Five, okay. feet. five feet. So kind of a maintenance of property, It'd be able to get around the house and do what needs to be done to houses. And the condition talks about minimizing it to ten feet, ten feet tall. Mm -hmm. So five perhaps here. Five. Or six feet. Okay. And then it's larger to have some.
So with all of that review, you as a professional planner, if that's what you do, you balanced it with the interest of the applicant and what they wanted to have, and you said, well, this is what I recommend is reasonable. And then we're here today to see, is that an acceptable outcome? It's what you're recommending. What's up here with some revisions to what's on the PowerPoint <clears throat> as the reasonable use of the property. Well, thank you. Thank you for your report. We'll get input now from the applicant and others that are here and then come to a decision. How would you like to proceed? Do you want to get, do each of you have something to say on this application? Do you want to get this input first and sure. then be able to respond to it? Okay, well, good morning to you. Each of you would like to speak today on this application yes. for reasonable use. All right, well, let's begin here. If you'd raise your right hand, you swear to tell the truth in the testimony you give today. I do. Please state your name for the record. Amy Everhart. And you also have a written comment in. I don't, no. I, was I, I thought I saw that as one of our exhibits. Um, from earlier, I had earlier, some email. Yeah. Emails were made, yeah. emails are part of the record. Oh, I should have mentioned, yeah, email, it's a yeah. public comment, okay. All right, so we have an email in the record, and you're here today with what information to present? Um, primarily, there is the, the area in the bed David was talking about, because our property, it backs up along the wetland A, so there's two properties. There's That's to the north? Um, the day is to the north, so but also the north east. And east. And your property is which direction? We are not directly behind, but a little bit diagonal. Okay. So there's there's that area that's in the back. Um, it's like a wet. It's it's considered, I guess, wetland A. Am I right? I'm, <laughs> you know that like that little squishy area in the back. It's in the south southeast yeah. corner. So that area right there. Mm -hmm. is extremely saturated like water. I mean, there's water in there all year round. Through the summer, through everything, it's completely saturated soil. Um, so I think the concern that, that we have, as well as the Tamolas, who it, it backs up onto their property, is that since it is in a floodplain, that we are concerned that I know in a perfect world, all of the water would the direction it's supposed to but I would like to know um, if it doesn't because you're building a large property if like you know the you know like the um, the properties on the other side of the brewers that there's they're crazy wetland areas and our water is supposed to flow a certain way and it's not mm -hmm. so my concern is is if this is all privately owned the city has nothing to do with any of the drainage back here. What measures are in place is if that water does start creeping up onto our properties, how, what are the steps being taken? Are there, is that us having to contact our new neighbors? Um, because the city, like, that's the issue I'm having right now in the front of us, is it's, pri it's privately owned. So we own part the church owns part. I can't get a hold of the church to deal with the, the drainage issue in the front. So my concern now with this weather is in the future, if it starts to go towards us, mm -hmm. what are, what are, what's in place for that? That's, that's a big concern for, for myself and for the Tamolas and they couldn't be here because they had to be at work. Okay. Um, so that's a big, that's a big concern for us. Mm -hmm. And I know like there's a lot of, I, I don't know the engineer, I'm not an engineer and I know that there's a lot of stuff put in place for it to flow correctly, but things happen. Um, and okay, building so a this house is something you've it. thought about quite a bit. Uh, yeah. And how yeah. it could maybe impact your own property coming to the north and east. Uh, have you thought about what could be done to prevent that from happening? Um, I, I mean, like I said, I'm not an engineer, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what would happen? You know, I have no idea how to get the water the other direction. I guess I need to know from from the city and the builder what exactly the steps are okay. that are going to be taken. And is the city going to be responsible? Is it going to be the property owner that's responsible for dealing with any sort of issues that arise maybe 10 years from now? 
you know, I don't know, it's not going to happen overnight. So. Okay, so that's a legitimate concern, and we'll see if we can get more information okay. from the applicant and the city on that and, issue. And so, and that's one concern, and then I guess this is more looking over the SEPA environmental checklist. Um, I guess for me, a, kind of a red flag for me is that it's filled out by the, the owner, and I guess for the city of Issaquah, that is more of a question for the city why it's filled out by the owner and not by the city. If it's an environmental checklist, you know, it's saying that there's no, no wildlife being seen it's saying that there's no endangered species being seen, and we've lived there for seven years. There's bears, coyotes, um, woodpeckers. I mean, it's it's a big wildlife area. Um, sorry, so it does not is, seem accurate. Is it what doesn't. You're it doesn't. And but they don't. They don't live there, so how are they gonna? You know what I mean? How are they gonna know? They don't. They don't. You know, put out a night camera. <laughs> um, and I think, I guess that was, that was kind of a big thing for me. And I think when I saw, I was really interested when I saw that the Indian tribes had some input in it. I talked to David about this. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> you know, and I guess if the city of Issaquah is saying that they're, you know, we're kind of looking at how this will impact um, environmentally, then it really should be filled out by environmentalists at the city. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was, I think those were my two. So two main concerns, one deals with the water and the other is what is the environmental impact if right. you're not completing a form in an accurate way, you may not be aware, I may not be aware of what the environmental impacts would be. Right. So, okay. And I think those are my the two main concerns. And I have to say that the wolves have been great. You know, we had a lot of discussion back and forth mm -hmm. with, um, because originally everything was going to be going through our yard, all the, all the drainage? All, no, no, no. All, all the utilities. Oh, I see. And so they really, you know, went above and beyond finding other ways because they were going to have to dig up everything that we had planted since we've lived there. So I sincerely appreciate that. Okay, good. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. We'll get some responses, okay. but let's get other comments in. If you please raise your right hand and you swear to tell truth and testimony you give today. Thank you. And your name, please. Betsy Brewer. It's Betsy. Can you do that one more time? B R E W E R. Oh, okay. Got it. <laughs> Betsy Brewer. And you have some comments too. I live at 1065 Sixth Avenue. Okay. Where, where, is, where is that in relation? Right next to Amy. Okay. So I don't know. Dave, do you have this slide? Yeah. Would it this be one open? might be easier to picture. Um, that is great. Sure. David's going to point out your. Okay. Oh, sorry. Right. Uh, yes. Right across, across the church. church. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The church. Between this property yeah. and the church. I'm right next to the two undeveloped properties. Mm hmm. Um, and I just want to let the wolves know I'm not against development. It's just we have a very, very fragile neighborhood. So my concern is. south from the church yes yes so that is undeveloped okay. or there was development like years and years, I mean historically anyway it is currently undeveloped an example 
example of impact is uh, as an Eagle Scout project, and then I forget who's maintaining it, Dave, you might know, is it the city? When they went in and cleared <coughs> all the blackberries, which was great, but um, as soon as they did that, just water just shoots right through there into our street, into the streams, because all those plants that were holding the water were removed. Mm -hmm. More recently, and I've been in discussion with Dave, um, legal and illegal clearing have happened of those two properties to the south of me, to the south. Um, and I do believe it has exacerbated part of my house sinking. Um, so my point is that this neighborhood is very fragile something in one part and it will affect the other. Lewis Lane is lower than our street and they will easily flood. For example, when the church illegally dumped the ditch along um, those undeveloped uh, uh, properties south of me, the neighbors directly behind them flooded because the water just shoots right through there. Um, the field next to the Timolers or even before Amy and the Timolas were there. Water also comes kind of directly through the field, kind of southwest. Um, so water comes from many different directions. Um, and I just think more experts just need to analyze that. My concern too of that stream that runs behind the property, um, and it also runs behind all the properties on Lewis Lane. Um, if you start putting too much water into that, that might affect those houses. I'm not a hydrologist, I'm just saying it could very significantly impact that. Um, as Dave Faber mentioned, our whole neighborhood drains into Issaquah Creek also. So if you have a lot of sediment that's running into the creek, that's not great for salmon. Um, the environmental So describing on the SEPA environmental checklist, I'm going back to that, about the water runoff, and the will said runoff from the impervious areas will be dispersed towards the outside streets. So my concern is how much, and it can significantly impact um, the area. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, and it says, does the proposal alter or otherwise affect drainage patterns in the vicinity of the site? If so, describe, and they said no. Well, as I just mentioned, anything in our neighborhood affects it significantly. Um, I will say, you know, Amy the builder did a great job because I was very concerned about getting flooded, but he did a great French drain system and handle the water and we do not drain. We're actually probably better off. So there can be things that can be done. Um, And they mentioned the proposed dispersion of runoff is considered a, a low impact development, and I would disagree with that. Um, so my concern is Dave Faber had looked at um, is the size of the property. Um, I do think it's pretty significant for our area in a hundred year floodplain with all the water impacts um, and with the accessory dwelling units. So I would like that to be really at again because um, I do believe the footprint is awfully large for our neighborhood with the environmental impacts. As Amy also mentioned about the animals, um, list threatened endangered species. Now I don't know exactly who's endangered, who's not, this is an unknown and it says animals. Um, is the site part of a migration route? It's an unknown. Well that's um, is not true. So the migration route of deer, bear, coyotes was in the field right next to me where Amy and the Timolas currently are because they access that stream. So right now they still do come off of, um, because part of Tiger Mountain is DNR land, it's protected. So they do come off of Tiger Mountain along the high school trail and down um, between uh, Maluskis and this property we're talking about, they do continue to access that stream. Um, and they do run.
run along the stream, even behind the neighbors at Lewis Lane. Um, so just being aware of that, um, that that stream uh, provides Okay, well that's helpful information. Is there more too that you wanted to provide? Um, I don't think so. I just okay. would like to see, and maybe already has, I'm not sure, um, like I said, more um, experts coming in, like Fish mm -hmm. and Wildlife. I can't remember all the agencies that were involved with the Southeast Bypass, but um, you know, we would do, especially hydrology, it's really significant mm -hmm. in our neighborhood since we are in a yeah, and if I and if I would if I could add, I think I really uh, wh why I'm concerned about that area in the back is because it is so saturated year round. It is everything else can be dry, and you go in there and it's wet. That's why the birds all are in that little area because it's saturated all year round. So and the property south of me are saturated too, and it is unfortunate they got cleared. Um, the same thing. Right. They're, and they're, I, so it would be great to see like what what can what can this hold like how much water can this hold and how much water can it hold going if it everything's directed one way because that it, it, you know how much can that hold once it's pushed another direction if it gets overflowed because mm -hmm. like I said like we are we're the only like we have huge ditches in the front of our house that the entire street all of all of Kramer come into our we have an extensive ditch. System. We ha have a huge, they, all the water comes in front of our house, and since it's privately owned, it's supposed to shoot out on the other side. Well, I'm responsible for clearing it, but I can't get a hold of the church for them to clear their side of it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not working as well as it should. Okay. Like, I, like and I, because I can't contact, I don't know who to call at the Mormon church. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, and it's not, so now we're, starting to overflow because it's been raining. Our ditches are overflowing. So and just one more example of impervious surface. When we moved in that our street um, was gravel like Lewis Lane is, I think it still is the same as Lewis Lane. Still I think is. it is, yeah. Um, so since the church, they did pave it themselves and now it's been repaved by the city because of sewer going down is we, that's what Amy's talking about is we get a significant more water because they angle it towards our houses going into our ditches going into our properties which feed into toward the wolf residence toward it's a creek um, it is not being um, absorbed on the street like it was when I first moved in and when did you first move in 97 1997 okay. so you you've seen changes over a number of years yes. And so generally, is it that water has concentrated more in this area that you're discussing, the south area, or has it always been It's saturated? always been that way. So for us, when we first moved in, the water would come from the field south of the church, and it would also come from the field. It was a field on Amy's property and the Tamola's property. It would come from those two directions, which is kind of behind Kramer. It comes from behind there through the field um, that way. unless the creek crosses its banks, but the city has done such a great job with um, measures that it has not. Okay, so less flooding since you've moved in of the yeah, creek well, itself. Well, what the city has done. Right, um, but, but more concern about the water coming from that wetland area. Yeah, and like I said, when the Eagle Scout project and the, I think it's the city is maintaining, we do get a significant amount more water coming through the field still to this day a lot, even though they have replanted, it's not to the level of all those blackberries. And I'm not saying blackberry, I prefer that, but I'm just saying the number of plants that were absorbing the water. Um, so our street will form a lake and sometimes um, we can't drive through it. And the church has their whole parking lot angled, which is a little tattoo too. The 
all the water just runs off the church into the ditches. It comes out the field, comes through the church parking lot, comes behind the Kramers, and I guess from the Tamolas and through there. Okay. So what I'm hearing is there's some problems now with the water primarily flowing through the wetland area, filling up maybe the stream, overflowing, uh, causing flooding on the streets. And your plea, or what you want to get more information on, is this proposal going to make that worse, or is there any possibility it could improve that? Okay, and then the other concern is not full disclosure on wildlife, stream flows, and other things that are part of the environment. Because when you looked at the checklist. I would like to see more experts involved, mm -hmm. especially on a SEPA environmental checklist, people that would really know or take the time to uh -huh. understand the area. Okay. All right, good. Well, thank you both. And let's now get information from the applicant and also anything we can get from the city to help respond to those two areas of concern. <coughs> so, who'd like to speak for the Street? Um, yeah, if you raise your right hand, it takes over. Swear to tell truth and testimony you give. I do. You are Jim Merrill James. Okay, well, you've heard testimony from the city, a couple of concerned citizens. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take them in order? Do you have, have any concerns with the city's recommendation? We don't. You reviewed the conditions and you think all the conditions are yes. reasonable? Yes, they are. And what is your area of expertise? Uh, I'm an architect. Thank you for being here, and I'm ready to listen to what you have to offer. Sure. So, uh, since it's fresh in all our minds, why don't I address uh, the comments first? Okay. Talk about some of the other um, things. So, um, first thing is if, and I don't know, unfortunately, it's, can I project to the screen or? Do you have a little? Laser pointer, you mean? You've got. I, I can just show if that's all right with you. I just show. I have your plans. If, are there various plans you want to project up here? Or? Yeah, I would like to have the survey projected up there. Well, is that that may be included in our record? It, we may have it as an exhibit. Let's identify an exhibit number if we can so that we know what you're referring to in the record. Uh, it is, uh, is this survey this, 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 Civil site plans, That's is that perfect. how it's identified? You've put it up on the screen. That means it's oh, 130 one feet above sea level. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and this is the next contour line here, and it's 128, so it's two feet lower than this. And this is what is happening here. The, the contour comes around the, um, this really wet area, right sort of behind Amy's house, where the, you've got standing 
water most of the time. Um, and that, the 128, sort of makes this happen. The, the contour of the land makes this really wet. So that comes around here. The creek down here, this is the 126 line, and it is coming through here. So the creek is at about 126. Where we're building would be 128. Where Amy's house is, is probably 130, and I'm not certain where your house is because it's been on this map. Uh, that's easy. Um, and the point, I, so that's that's the first thing is that the water, once it gets here, is flowing sort of this way. It's coming this direction, but not this way. Well, we've had our, the back of our yard flood before. Yes, understood. But that is, that's probably the same. That's because of this contour line, not because of what we're doing in terms of development. We are not proposing to change the grade of this at all. So the grade would remain the same. And code requires us to put in what are called flood vents. And flood vents are about three wide by two foot tall, they're screened, but the purpose of those vents is when there is a flood, the water actually flows through the crawl space and out the other side. My concern being in a 100-year uh, floodplain is our water table is very significant year-round. So all I'm asking is, I think, some more um, study So hydrology would be civil engineering, and we have a civil engineer on board. He may not have received that in the packet, but we have a complete uh, drainage study on the property, and all of the water that we're, including the water on the driveway, <coughs> is being put into um, these uh, basically French drains, which then have an opportunity to soak into the ground before they go to the creek. So all of the impervious surfaces, the roofs, the driveway, and any other material from the house are actually in French drains. So we're not- I thought the driveway was paved though. Sorry? It, the driveway's paved, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, here's the drain for that driveway that comes into there and then goes this way. And the driveway actually has its own So you referred to a, a hydraulic report. Do you know if that's in front of us as one of the uh, exhibits? Do you know who did that study? Yes, um, it was done by uh, Encompass, and it's number six. Okay, number Prelimin three. preliminary technical information report, yeah. Encompass Engineering, dated August 2017. That's right. So we're looking at that as exhibit seven. And copies of that would be available to the neighbors here from the city yes. uh, if you wanted to copy that. But I'd make a note of that. To, I'd be happy to forward those to you. Now, is, is that, um, is this engineering uh, firm someone you paid for, or is the city providing this to you? The city never does engineering on private properties. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always provided by consultants, but the city reviews it in great detail. study you're referring to? I think he's mentioned... This is the Exhibit 6, and we have this drainage report. We're going to follow a little bit of a sense of order here. Okay, I'd like Mr. Merrill, he had some information he wanted to present. Let's let him do that and keep track of your questions, because then after he's sort of explained all that, we'll come back and, 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 and ask those questions and get some clarity. In the meantime, I too am looking at the Exhibit 6 in more detail. 
Do you want to continue with your explanation? What I just discussed is purely to take care of the drainage on the impervious surface. Um, and it would not matter what time of year that study was done. It's purely done on the soils report from the geologist um, and the civil engineering um, calculations uh, based on the square footage. Can you explain that again? Your, your concern, and please help. Give me a little bit of background for this. So your expertise is in architect. Yes. And how do you take uh, uh, the impervious surface considerations into account when you're doing architectural analysis of your vehicle? Well, we've minimized um, this, the impervious surface. You minimize the impervious surface. View, and then it, from there on, it's taken over by a civil engineer mm -hmm. who does the. Well, it begins to, but I, I, I'm taking a look at the Exhibit 6, and I see that uh, the reference that, that you made to the preliminary technical information by Encompass, that's a, it's, it's, it's fairly terse. It doesn't go into a lot of detail. It just mentions that there's some sheet flow of water to the west. And then it encompasses a review by Altman Oliver Associates. Are, are you familiar with that? Yes, they are the biologists we hired. Mm -hmm. And that may be getting closer to what you're talking about with enhancements. What, what stopped me was your comment about how you're going to improve drainage in the neighborhood. Sure. And I wondered, based on what? Not on the Encompass report, because no, that doesn't no, say anything based on at all. The, but based on the biology. Yeah. That's what this planting is designed to do. It's designed by a biologist to improve the environment around the house. Mm -hmm. and, to, and they're all native species that are being planted. So in terms of wildlife habitat, yes, we, there is going to be a house there. There are other houses in the neighborhood. Uh, I live on uh, the backside of Squawk Mountain. So, um, I'm, I'm sorry, do you want to complete that thought? Well, I've, ju I've just noticed that the deer feel safer <laughs> around the house, it, it seems like, because the, the cougars aren't chasing them. Uh, on, well, I'm, I'm not kidding. There are so many deer in our neighborhood. It's unbelievable. You will not be able to have a garden. And don't plant any roses. They love roses. Okay. So wildlife you're commenting on. Yeah, wildlife. especially for birds. Okay, well we may need to get some more detail. I'm looking at the report that you referenced. It's a, a letter to you by Altman, Oliver, and Associates. And it appears that there's just one paragraph. I'm gonna read it. Uh, the proposed enhancement plan. Now, I'm not sure what that references. Uh, there may be a separate plan that I'm not aware of. Exhibit nine, and we can show it up on the screen. Okay, we should get that then because it references the proposed enhancement plan would revegetate the degraded wetland and buffer with a wide variety of native trees and shrubs that will significantly increase the plant species, structural diversity of the critical areas over current conditions. The enhanced buffer will further increase the habitat and protective functions of the buffer by providing a visual and physical screen to the wetland and stream from the development. Now that speaks to wildlife. I'm not sure it speaks to the 
water conditions, surface water. So this is the proposed plan plan as you mentioned. There are four thousand plants and then put in here, you know, any that you have put in sprinkler system alive in the first two years or during Yeah, that we have that right now. <coughs> so Okay, so you're referencing exhibit nine. Have you seen the, the landscaping plan at all? We've seen this, yeah. yeah. Okay, you have the I exhibits. This okay. Is what I'm showing you now. okay, and so it's your what opinion? Is that as an architect that have you worked in similar situations that you have an opinion on, on how this Absolutely. planting plan would well, what impact it might have? An architect, I was also a builder for twenty years. You were what? I was a builder for twenty years okay. also. Sorry, when it was what? When it was natural before development. And what, what's the baseline? What, what would be reference for what's natural? Uh, what's natural in that area, we're probably um, uh, fir trees and uh, probably cedars, as well as a lot of the same sort of plants here. Again, these are all native plants. Uh, certainly, it probably came all the way through here around the wetlands. There are some bigger trees in here that are not doing so well because they're in the water. Big trees don't do well in, in the water itself. So are you suggesting that those go away? No. Oh. Okay, Woodpecker so love dead trees. So this, this is the, the plan to reduce the impact of, of any water off-site. Okay, and we may return to that, I'll allow you to ask some questions, but did you have other information you wanted yeah, to provide? Addition, right now you've got Himalayan blackberries that are covering about probably at least a half of this area of this country. And that's considered to be an invasive species that just spreads and spreads and spreads. So we're, we're all familiar with that. We are getting rid of that still. Really? Yes. I wonder what methodology you might use, because I'd like to learn about that. <laughs> Well, in a site like this, you've got a lot of soil preparation to get ready to plant like this, so they'll actually be trying to get the roots out. That's and and that's a challenge plant. because you mentioned earlier there'd be no grading of the site, but there will be disturbance of the site. There'll be raking of the soil, yes, to get the okay. water to try to get the root balls out yeah. of the soil itself. So in terms of the final grade, there'll be no change for this landscape. No disturbance. Okay. All right. So that's that's one step, and again, this is for protection, improvement of habitat, and protection of surface water flows. So that the water would, the goal is to have it drain through the site rather than go off site. Yes. So to bring back the drainage stuff. And is that what is meant by low impact development? I know Betsy mentioned yes, it is. concern about low impact development. What does that mean to you as an architect? Well, this site is almost an acre. So it's 11% of the overall site. That's an extremely low ratio of uh, development to the property itself. Okay, so that's part of it. So this low impact development, you also mean that you try to keep the water on site and not move it off site? Yes, that is correct. Some of those terms are a little confusing. Low impact development sounds like you're not going to impact anything, but you do have an impact. But the goal is to keep it on the site itself and not to impact off-site. Okay. Uh, we'd like to point out, too, that the 
civil engineering uh, plan that's required for this application is a preliminary. So we still have a long ways to go working with the city for the to get the final civil engineering design approved. Mm -hmm. So we got a you know a fairly low threshold for materials for this this examination. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the nature of this permit itself is to look at what is a reasonable use. But your testimony is is that that is only the first step and there's a lot more design features that need to be revealed. The biology work is, is basically complete, but the civil engineering work uh, we still have to finalize. And by that you mean where drains are and Maybe we'll have, is that something you want to explain? Sure. Okay. Um, let's let Mr. Merrill, can you, you want to finish up your initial testimony and then we're going to fill in some gaps. Sure. Um, I guess going back to the basis of the property, there will be a uh, split rail or see-through three foot tall fence of that is so that when you're mowing lawns and so forth, you don't mow over onto the uh, wetland buffer area. And otherwise, there is no fencing on this property. So wildlife is free to be here. Yeah. Some of the neighborhoods are of um, other uh, aspects of the project. Uh, this is a 54-inch diameter culvert. It was installed uh, in concert with uh, BLE. Uh, I'm sorry, with the Wildlife uh, Fish and Wildlife Fish and Wildlife Fish and Wildlife back in 2009, I believe. And fortunately, stubbed out water and sewer onto the property. And that, there's easements that run this way at, at the south edge of uh, Amy's property. And the power pole and the water meter are actually out here on, on the other street. We are not proposing any access through Lewis Lane. So in terms of traffic, etc. on Lewis Lane, we're not having any impact, no impact, we're not doing any utilities through Lewis Lane, and no impact through Lewis Lane. Um, all of our utilities are coming from Mount Linder, the BLE is the owner, and they already were, uh, when they installed their culvert, they also installed conduits for power and uh, phone, etc. So the stub out at the southeast corner there, you're not intended to use that? Yes, we are. This is sewer and water. Okay. This is for power, gas, and phone. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's find out. Either of you have any questions for Mr. Merrill? Dispersion means that the water goes, flows out, and is, uh, and then it goes into the soil as it's flowing out. That's that's the term for dispersion. So we are proposing dispersion. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, does the proposal alter, otherwise affect drainage patterns? And this is when I mentioned that before. It says no. So I'm going to go back. our 
benches fill, all the water tables fill up, um, and then you start having runoff. So I would like to see an engineering report in the winter, like during our worst time. Because I do disagree that it does make an impact. Um, you really can't understand water flow on a piece of paper in our neighborhood. It really does affect, you really have to see architect of making comments of, oh, I'm going to put some plants and it'll affect water, it'll, affect, it'll help wildlife. I guess I just want to see more experts um, writing reports. Um, well, I'm, I'm not done. Um, you know, you say, I, I agree, all those, wild, those uh, native plants are great, but I think you're forgetting that you have the footprint of the house in the middle of the property. So I do disagree that just the plants alone will improve um, the hydrology. Um, and like I said before, I am concerned of the size of the footprint of the house given our neighborhood. Maybe in another neighborhood that's not in a floodplain, it would be adequate. Um, and uh, yeah. And um, I think Amy and I would like copies of the You mentioned that there was a lot of gravel in that lot. There was one pile, yeah. so that whole lot was not gravel. Well, if you kind of, I've been well, I've been walking through there for seven years. The kids have kind of dispersed it from plain. I mean, it was when we first moved there. It was a pile when they looked like they were going to start something, and so I mean, it's really not all over. It's the same material that's in the back of our yard, cool. in the very back that we we had to plant over four thousand plants as well. Um, and they're still growing and perhaps at one point they'll suck up a lot of water. But like I said, I don't know how much more that area can handle. Like I don't know how much more water because I don't, I haven't seen a biologist report. I don't know how saturated it is. And I've been talking to um, Denise Perolo here at is City of Issaquah because, because of the amount of runoff that we're dealing with. And because the water's supposed to run a certain way down Sixth Avenue, and it's not. So there are things that can go wrong in the future. Like it's, this is looking, this impacts us long term. It impacts us 20 years from now. We're trying to get a hold of the wolves. So we're trying to get a hold of the church because it's privately owned. So now, I mean, this, this came at a good, it came at a, at a, good time for me because we are dealing with water issues in the front of our house. And so it's going to impact us down the road in the back of our house and I would like to get a handle on it now because now I'm having to deal with what happened in front of us from however long ago. And you know, in a perfect world everything would run exactly to plan, but you know, it's life. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to approach it this way, and I think Mr. Merrill's trying to respond to the questions. Yep. You've referred to the site investigations that have been done. I've been looking through them as you've been asking questions and getting responses. Uh, one thing I'll note is that the wetlands uh, site visit was done in November, even though the report is August. So that it does appear that it was done, and that, that's a really good question to ask because still often. Say November's still no, I understand that. I'm saying the wetland uh, site visit was done in November, yeah. which I'm typically saying that is. A, I would like to see many months. I, I, I understand. Yeah. But just so what we have now, the way I want to approach this, see what we have now and what might be needed to address concerns. I don't think it's just a concern of neighbors. I'm sure applicants share the same concern. They don't want to live in the middle of a pond, no. you know, and <laughs> they don't want to see water intruding the house. So this is good information to get out. I'm going to look at how we might make it better and what's involved in city review as it goes forward because there may need to be some additional study done. I'm not concluding that, 
but I am looking at what's been done so far. And the reference to the 2005 study by the geotechnical report, geotechnical engineers, Geo Group Northwest, they did speak to drainage. Do you recall how they did that? I'm sorry, I do not. Well, it's a little different than what might be represented or what you might think because it's fairly standard. The finished site grade should direct surface water away from the structure. Well, that's smart. Yeah. <laughs> you that's want a, that. That's a code. During construction, water should not be allowed to stand in areas where slabs or other elements are to be constructed. Well, that's pretty standard. And then here's, here's the, the recommendation. And often we have as conditions, geotech recommendations shall be followed. And here's what it is, a footing drain should be installed around the perimeter foundation. The drain should consist of four inch minimum diameter perforated or slotted, richer drain pipe laid at or near the bottom of the footings with a gradient sufficient to generate flow. The drain line should be bedded on, surrounded by and covered with free draining rock or free draining granular material. It should be wrapped with geotext, fiber, et cetera. Sounds pretty standard, doesn't it? Now there's nothing mentioned about flow through the foundation yet this is geotech and it seems the city then is asking and you as an architect are understanding this really isn't sufficient. You're not going to capture everything in a four inch foot. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree? I would 100%. Yeah. So I, I think it's good to point out, yes, there's been some review done, but even consistent with the neighbors, like we're not sure that's going to do it. I think you came to the same conclusion and something more needs to be done. And, and this flow through, as you said, the foundation itself, that might do it. But maybe, maybe Mr. Favor, you might have some information, or Mr. Merrill, what, what steps would be done prior to construction to get a better grasp of what would happen with the uh, sheet flow uh, of water or any additional water moving through this wetland area? Okay. Uh, well, uh, so we have civil engineers on staff. Well, in fact, this city has adopted the most recent version of that manual. Yeah. yeah, and there's no vested right about previous versions. So the current stormwater manual would need to be complied with. And you have a general conceptual sense of what that is. And isn't that, as Mr. Merrill testified, water should be infiltrated on site, if at all which, possible. which is in conflict with this move it off site and installing drains to get it off site. So there's, there's some confusion there. And, and what, what role does your staff play then in looking at this uh, to get assurance that there would be compliance with the stormwater manual? Because it seems that's where everyone wants to go. You want to make sure it can be handled on site. Is that during the building permit review? Yes, it is. It's also happened during this review. So this... this Because that's part of the criteria, isn't it? It's not a, no negative impacts on, on surrounding properties. step you take to try and keep as much water as possible on the property. And we require a soils report prepared by our licensed soils engineer to determine what is the type of soil and can it accept the water. And if it can, then step two is to send the water off the property in the best, <coughs> most controlled manner possible. So that's why I, I would see this combination of plants and amended soils to accept the water So let's see if we can deal with that. So Mr. Merrill, you're familiar as a builder and as an architect. 
uh, the need for uh, review prior to beginning construction is. And something's needed here, I think, before you actually start scraping soil away and putting in a foundation. And what might that be? And you've probably discussed this already with your clients, but I'm thinking this review, what we're looking at today is, can there be reasonable use of the property? And the reason we look at that is if I conclude that there's no reasonable use of the property, that is a, can be considered a taking of the property. And then there's a process that goes through to determine value and it's condemnation of the property. And it's very elaborate. And basically uh, the property then is, uh, is taken from private use by government. And nobody really wants that outcome. So this is kind of a relief valve. Can reasonable use be made? But as the city's already reviewed and Mr. Murrell's here to discuss and I think shares the concern, how can that be done in a way that actually enhances the area and doesn't make it worse? So what's your thought on what type of review might be done of this drainage issue before you actually begin building? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, the civil engineer civil engineer would be on site uh, this winter. Um, secondly, um, as a condition of this approval, we're willing to, at our expense, bring the biologist back out in March and have him look at things again and write a recommendation letter <coughs> for any additional mitigation we can possibly do. Uh, we are doing everything that situation of the status quo, but to actually improve the situation. Okay, and that, that's really helpful. So you would work with uh, probably the same consultants, but to a greater level of detail? Right. And I would point out that the biology was then reviewed by a city-hired second biologist. So a second biologist was brought in by the city, reviewed our work, Is the city biologist, are they out on site or are they just looking at? So the city biologists, they go out with the hired biologists. Is that what I'm understanding? Close. Um, it's, we, we, hire, we asked the applicant to hire a second biologist, which we contracted with. It's the watershed company. And they visited the site. Followed up actually the river and stream board meeting. We had a, a, a meeting in this room. Yeah, I was all. here. I know. <laughs> and and in that in that meeting, I think some of these same concerns about hydrology came up in the in the board that night said, please look at hydrology issues when the peer review person, which is the watershed company, is being visited by a hire. Yeah, I think we Looks do like have that. A and they came up with a series of recommendations that we incorporated conditions. And they looked at, I don't know if they looked at or they added the, the whole sheet flow system we see up here. That was the their review and comment on how are you gonna live with the hydrology so it doesn't impact the village land use. And I recall that watershed said that's this is acceptable and this this addresses it. So and the watershed companies that's <coughs> exhibit ten and they did conclude with nine recommendations of how to deal with the uh, stormwater dispersion issue and it includes um, dispersion trenches must be calculated as buffered impacts recommend a dense native 
herbaceous community in the inner 10 feet of the flow path, woody species tolerant of saturated conditions in the outer 15 feet. And then conduct an analysis of the existing culvert to determine if it complies with current standards. Uh, complete a zero rise analysis of the 100 year floodplain, including calculations supporting the length and width of the vegetative flow paths, along with hydrology and hydraulic modeling provide compensatory floodplain storage as needed to comply with no net rise requirements. So that's the key one there. I don't know if you've seen this report, but that's, that's the type of thing that you would want to track as it was being reviewed. And, and so would everyone. I, I don't think there's any conflict in the room. So you're here because you're concerned, and I'm sure applicants are listening and saying, if that's what we're coming into, we sure want to make sure it's taken care of. So this, this uh, watershed report with that particular recommendation of no net rise, that's exactly what you're talking about. So is this by the watershed, that's the biologist? That's the correct? city, that's recommend the city. a city consultant that the applicant paid for. Now is that an environmental biologist or is it only for drainage? So it's are they, sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh. So, they, so they looked at the whole area and decided there was no wildlife? Is that, is that what you're, like this was done after? Uh, this was actually there's no wildlife. Yeah, there's, there's there's no, we're going to get to well, that. I'm just, I'm just I just didn't know if this was an environmental biologist or if it was a biologist only for water runoff. This was, was primarily a mitigation of the water. Okay. So it did a checklist we're going to get to in a minute about the wildlife because okay. that's a kind of a second okay. issue. Okay. We're dealing with the stormwater okay. impacts right now. That's, so that's what watershed primarily does. Mm -hmm. Okay. So David, would you have a copy of that too? Uh, yes. Yeah, you should have copies of all these exhibits. They're, they're available to you, and, and it's, it's unfortunate you weren't able to review them before the hearing today. But you're, you're, you're helping to focus on what are the key elements of these exhibits. And that's one that uh, now Mr. Merrill is familiar with as well. Uh, that recommendation from Watershed is what you incorporated into your recommended conditions, correct? And, and that, that uh, when you look at that closely, the zero rise analysis of the existing floodplain, including calculations supporting length and width of vegetated flow paths, along with hydrology and hydraulic modeling, and then provide compensatory floodplain storage as needed to make sure there's no net rise. I think that's exactly what you're talking about. And what needs to happen, and maybe you can be involved as that work is done, to be in touch with the city staff, people that might be looking at this to make sure you agree and that, and that they have the information from you about where those vegetated paths have been. Because we know about water, it can move from year to year. Where does it go? I think, it, Dave, it would be really helpful to include myself, any neighbors, because we have another neighbor who's been, whose family's been there 100 years and knows even more than I do. I think we can be a valuable, a valuable resource well, here's what we can do to help address that. Like if someone comes yeah. and is looking at the neighborhood, they're looking at one day. Yeah. I'm looking at 20 plus years. He's looking at even more. Well, why don't we write that right into the condition? Mr. Favor, maybe you can see in your report where that condition. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Merrill, you may know too. Yes. Did you take a look at those conditions? Do you have the staff, the staff report? You may not. Eight copies here, right? And, and uh, as he's giving you those copies, uh, 10 and 11 deal with the, the flooding concern. And you'll see the condition 10 relates to the watershed review. Condition 10 is that flood hazard permit shall include a certification by a licensed civil engineer <coughs> registered in Washington that compensatory storage is provided and the hydraulic capability of the floodplain is preserved on site to convey floodwaters through the property without affecting adjacent properties. I think that right on addresses your concern and what we can do is modify that condition 
to include that that civil engineer consults with you before making the conclusions. And I think any, any good professional would do that, would want to visit the site, not only indicate the site visit, as Mr. Merrill suggested, but that they consult with, with neighboring property owners to gain information prior to uh, reaching their conclusions. Does that help address the concern? I think of that. Ha I think everybody would want that to happen. So I, I want you to have a house, and it would help you to. I mean, I didn't know anything about flooding. Any, and this is our first house until I moved in. Like, Whoa! So because it's your property or something, it could back up into your property. It's mm -hmm. very important. So. So if we modify condition ten to include, I don't want to wordsmith the exact language, but it would be to make certain there's visits during the winter months and consultation with neighboring property owners prior to making the conclusions in the report. And any good professional would do that, and in the report they'd reference, we, we talked with you and we determined the, the vegetative flow paths over the previous 20 years, you know, and you can help on that. You know where the water's gone. Right, and then you the other side of the road could right. do even more. And that's, that's good information that any engineer would want to have. And then when I look closely at this uh, condition 10, the conclusion has to be that there would be uh, flood plains preserved on site to convey flood waters through the property without affecting adjacent properties. To make that conclusion, I don't know if you can get a civil engineer to actually make that conclusion, but if they do, they're signing off as a licensed engineer. And although they always have, you know, this is based on what we know at the time and we don't want to be liable, it gets pretty close to who do you go to? That engineer is staking his professional reputation and potential liability on the conclusion that it would go through the properties and not affect the adjacent properties. I think that's about as good as you can get no, without having perfect. a bond post. I had this, I could have said number 10. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, this is something, and you'd want to keep this handy, and as it does move forward, and I appreciate you're not here saying we don't want a house. Correct. You understand it, it's going to happen, but it's I mean, how being, best we were, can be done. We're in a, a valley between Tiger and Squawk. We get a yeah. So that'll help, and we'll just modify that to make sure there's the site visit and consultation. Mm -hmm. You want to be named as, as specifically or just consultation with neighbors? Consultation. I, I know the smallest would be really extremely I think this neighbor. It just and I, and the one yeah, I'm there might be some challenges in meeting with people. Consultation yeah, with neighbors. Okay. So we'll do that, and I think we're getting pretty close to addressing this flood issue. Now, the other issue that you mentioned is the environmental checklist, and that has some background that... Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> it was, well, it sounds like <coughs> a lot of studies and things have been done, mm -hmm. so I'm sorry for my ignorance. I did not know that. I don't even know what that is. Well, that's why you come to a hearing, and sometimes <laughs> it's... You know, I appreciate at least you've met each other before. Sometimes at hearings, it's the first time that you meet applicants, and I often have people at least greet each other and say hello. Ah. So a lot of this will be through dialogue, you know, as things evolve, and I hope you have contact information for each other, because I'm sensing a process that might include, hey, we're looking at where exactly this, should this fence go? You know, should it be here or here? Where do you see deer movement across the property? That might be helpful, too. So ongoing dialogue. As to the checklist itself, did you have any more you wanted to present? Okay. Um, and I understand you completed the checklist? Yes. Let's get you under oath, if you would, and raise your right mm -hmm. hand. You swear to tell the truth and testimony you give. I do. Thank you. And, and you're the actual property owner. Yeah, I'm Taylor. Yeah. And I'm, I want to look at that checklist. And you might have it in front of you, too. That's Exhibit 15. Do you remember filling that out? Or did you actually do it, or did somebody else do it for you? I believe the civil engineer filled that out, didn't he? Or no, it was a joint effort between the yeah, civil engineer and joint. the biologist. Yeah. Well, it's signed by. And then I. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I signed it. That's required. Yeah, for the it's required for me. I, I guess I, I don't. The, our conversation was it's required by me to fill it out. Okay. To, or to, to sign it with consultation from all the experts we okay. hired. Yeah. Um, now, 
there was a timing issue when we we hired people and when that was filled out. Um, but we're just we were trying to follow on with the process. I think it's just a for me it's just a question of like trying to make sure your information's accurate. Um, right, and I'm going to discuss a little bit how this process works. And uh, David Favors already smiling because he knows where I'm going to go on this. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, it's, it's yeah, yeah I, I should do it rather than you, reality. but I've been at this a long time, and this is a real unfortunate aspect of review of proposed developments. We have in the state a very powerful law called the State Environmental Policy Act. An environmental checklist is the first step in looking at whether a proposed project has a significant adverse impact on the environment, and that's the key language, significant adverse impact. And it starts with the checklist. These checklists are problematic in every sense of the word. And you would not believe what I see. A lot of them I see these days, they're not even signed. They're done online. Nobody signs them. I appreciate Mr. Wolf signed it, but as he just indicated, he didn't complete it. I mean, you looked at it, right? But you didn't go through each question and fill it out. It was a, it was a, it was a variety of people weighing in. But yeah, yeah. And, and that's why you see questions answered in there like not now. Yeah, and, and nearly everybody does that. That's why I thought you probably didn't do it because the professionals in the field, that's what they're all doing now. Nothing known. And you'll notice it's signed saying, it's, I believe it's true and correct. It's not under oath. These could be signs saying, I certify under oath that it's true and correct. Then you're really into a, whether you're perjuring yourself or not. This well, isn't I pointed out, perjuring. though, if they did answer yes or no, it wasn't well, unknown. Yeah, unknown. And that's I guess that's my very is, standard. I understand what you're saying, and my concern, though, is if, it's, if someone's basing whether we're going forward based on something that's inaccurate, that's, and I understand well, I what agree. you're saying. Yeah, and here's the challenge. If it's inaccurate and you wanted to challenge it, there's an appeal period, and it's in the staff report. What the city does is they use the checklist, and then they issue a determination of non-significance that with conditions, and is that also part of the same exhibit? It was an appeal, and I think it was like a five hundred dollar filing thing. If I wanted to appeal something that was in this, I'm like, I'm a, I'm a neighbor. I'm not going to spend five hundred dollars to say I see bears. <laughs> you know right. what I, you know what I mean. But if you I take a look at bears. at what what Mr. Favor did, he looked at the checklist, and then he put in a number of conditions, and there's there's quite a number of mitigation measures, and and he noted that there needs to be a buffer enhancement plan. It has to include large trees and stormwater dispersion. So this began, but then went to additional studies and is still underway. And then I'll have a wetland biologist verify final site conditions, plant materials, plant locations, consulting wetland bio, uh, biologist to verify the enhancement planting has been installed. So you see there's a number of things that the city then, based on the disclosures, now, there's nothing in the conditions about wildlife because the disclosure didn't say anything about wildlife. And that's typical. You knew it was wrong. Yes, you could have appealed it. You didn't appeal it, and unfortunately, here's what happens. This becomes fixed in place. So we can't go back and change the checklist, even though I think even probably Mr. Wolf will say, well, I, I really didn't know. I mean, right? Isn't that your, your testimony about uh, wildlife? Yeah. I mean, tell me what have you how you've been on I mean, the property? I mean, we've been to the we've been to the property. I think, again, now sitting here now versus when we filled it out, right? There's a difference. We've been there a lot more, and so you're not going to see the cougars. You're not going to see the mountain yep. that you're holding cougars. But we've we've <laughs> since talked yeah, to was, we've was, since talked to the Maluskis, and they they I mean, they've texted us pictures of bears yeah. since we filled that out. It was over a year ago. That was in September yeah, of 2017. I think when we no, filled we that had out. A mom and three pups. And that's we another we flaw in the process. It's like you say, it's one the moment front in time. The back end. So unfortunately, I'd like to be able to rely on the checklist, but I, I usually don't. And all for all those reasons, it's just kind of a flaw in our review process. It doesn't work real well. There's ways it can be improved, and it may be someday, but right now the city has to rely on the checklist. I think actually the mitigation they did is more significant than you would usually see after looking at a checklist, often a, what's called a DNS is issued, no impact, no conditions. But Mr. Favor, and I've worked with, with, with David a long time, 
he takes it very seriously. He did everything he could to try to mitigate what he saw in the checklist. So you've got everyone kind of working towards the same goal here. I think with the, with the wildlife, I can note in my findings of fact that deer, bear, and other wildlife have been observed on the site. And then also note the testimony here that you're not gonna put up a, a fence that you have to jump over is when you can move through and go around. See, so there's some recognition. Um, it, that may help. Okay, I'm sorry I interrupted you. I'm doing all the talking after I put you under oath, but Mr. Wolf, do you have anything more you want to add? No, I think that's fine. Um, just affirming um, Mr. Merrill's testimony, and then, um, you know, as you guys have seen, we've, we've done a lot to try to be reasonable about working with the neighbors. We've worked with Amy, we've worked with the police chief. We haven't met, but um, uh, I think we're, we're willing to uh, abide by all the conditions, and there are a lot, and you've heard some of them, and um, it, unfortunately, you didn't get the, the full recommendations beforehand, but I think you'll see um, a lot of conditions in there. We spent a lot of time, we bought the property in um, September 2016, so over two years ago. So we spent a year and a half hiring experts to go examine the property and make sure, and working with experts that we hire, uh, plus the city to make sure we come up with a recommendation uh, that uh, passes the reasonable use bar and uh, mitigates as many impacts as possible, flooding, water, even things like um, uh, our car lights coming up the driveway, disturbing the Maluski. So we've gone down to pretty granular detail in, in order to mitigate all the impacts of the property. Um, I believe we're, we're improving the overall uh, health of the environment there. Uh, despite building a house, the improvement to the surrounding area uh, will offset, uh, will be a, a more positive impact than um, building the house. Um, and I think uh, the house itself, we have uh, made many revisions to the plan in an attempt to uh, bring it down to the minimal uh, reasonable use. Uh, we've reduced the size of the house, we've reduced uh, the roof, we've, we've reduced the driveway, we've reduced the yard, um, and uh, to get it as low as possible and to get it very, very close. Um, I, th I, think it's, I think it's under, but I have to check the previous uh, impervious surface and yard usage from the previous review. Uh, the house is bigger than it was before, but the driveway is much smaller, the yard is smaller, and so we're, we're making, we're making trade-offs, but again, trying to mitigate there. So um, I think that's I'm happy to answer questions as well. So when did you acquire the property? Uh, September 2016. So it's a long, a long process. It is. It's it a long is. process. It is. <laughs> and, because, and because we go to so much effort. No, we go to so much effort to make sure that the, the mitigation is right. Yes. And that's true in this state, particularly with all the legal requirements and how unfortunate you went through a whole shoreline process that ended up being not necessary, apparently. But that's what happens when you buy what some still call encumbered property. Mm -hmm. And it means encumbered, I guess, by regulations. Really a better term, it's highly regulated property because of the wetlands and the wildlife. And it's in an area that people clearly take seriously. You want to protect all the values of that property. So I appreciate you, you being here and understanding what we're trying to do. Uh, we'll just tweak those conditions a bit. Anything more you wanted to I, add? I just, just so I'm 100% clear of what's, of what's happening when I walk out of here, the civil engineer, what you are amending, or what it sounds like, the, the, the civil engineer is going to come out and then it's going to consult with the neighbors and then to, to verify that what is being done is not gonna affect the neighbors. And they're actually gonna, they're get, you were saying something that they take accountability. If, yes, so they can look at that condition 10 and 11 in the staff report. So 20 years from now, we have some huge issue. We need to find the civil engineer and file a grievance with them. Is that well, what I'm understanding? Well, hopefully you have a pleasant neighborhood <laughs> and you're in touch with your neighbors and I think not, you wouldn't go to the engineer, but you would remedy the problem. Okay, I just wanted to do. know in the, in the future, 
like, God forbid, something happens and I ha we have to look at mm -hmm. going the next step, they're the ones to be held accountable, not the wolves. It's the civil engineer that approved it. Am I correct? I, I'm well, just, I, I'm there's a lot of caveats to that. Right. But yes, that's what a good civil engineer okay. needs to do, is they're certified okay. with their expertise that there be no net rise and no negative impact okay. on surrounding properties. That's pretty much as good as you can get, Mr. Merrill. Um, the civil engineer we hire is in this town. And the- In Compass. In Compass. Yeah, they're the ours too. And they originally were Byman Holmberg, uh, which merged with In Compass, and there's still some Byman people around. Those folks were in Issaquah at least 40 years before they became so the, that's why we hired them, them as they're a local company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. You've heard the famous poet about good fences making good neighbors. Here, I think what we're looking at is good mitigation to make good neighbors. So hopefully you will see what everyone hopes to see is it improves. And, and then I guess the only other statement is in the future, I would love the city of Issaquah to you know, I would love that the environmental checklist was a little bit more of what's really going on in that environment. You know, that's just me personally. Like, I'm not gonna spend $500 to argue with it. Um, I mean, it just, you know, we all live and we all wanna protect our wildlife and streams and, and you know, I, it just Well, did kind you of, comment on that? Did you send in a comment on well, the environmental review? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Can I add? Yes, Dave, Dave. It was helpful that you comment. You, you went, and so then I went down through the checklist and it's like, oh yeah, there's not. And I added, I think in the document, maybe in red, I wrote some comments. And you did. Supplement. You did, and then that led to the mitigation so that, that you applied. Your comments helped me figure out mitigation or conditions oh, to true. add. Yeah. I just like, I just like our wildlife. Exhibit. I'm like a crazy, I'm the crazy that person great. that. No, I think this is helpful for the process because <laughs> your city is doing that and you can see, on, you, if you have a copy of that exhibit, is that um, there are in red comments and also uh, Well, had I city, known they were being published, they would have been a little bit more you thought out. You <laughs> the, city, the city provided it to the buckle shoots. The city put on some extra conditions. And you have to remember too, the environmental review at that stage, I know the wolves are learning about this than they ever wanted to know. Mm -hmm. But they're only looking at significant adverse impacts. Now at this stage, we're looking at all impacts. Mm -hmm. So it's getting more detailed, and then there's additional studies ahead. Yes. So you're really getting the focus on what the key issues are. And you have applicants here and an architect for the applicants that want to address that. And believe me, that doesn't always happen. So I would say count your blessings on that, that you can work in cooperation and not have to be in litigation, okay? <laughs> Any further final remarks? I'll, I'll make a comment that this, the, all the plans and all these reports are public record and, and what we can do is definitely send you the report, but we have a folder that if we pull review all the exhibits, and it's a nice share drive or one drive or all you just tech stuff, right? So we'll just send you a, a link to it and you can open up all the documents and then if this moves forward, if it goes to a building permit, the building permit process does not include public uh, notice, notice. Yeah. but the plans are record, public record, and you can come in and look at them. We can make them available electronically. We can pour over all the reports and all the plans and be involved as much as you want. Mm -hmm. Is the Department of Fish and Wildlife involved? Right. Our, our neighborhood flows into the Issaquah Creek. Uh -huh. and, you know, that is a critical there. Um, that's well, one thing about our neighborhood. Uh, they were involved in a hydraulic permit review. I think we have a copy of that as Exhibit 11. So that would be in the material that uh, David Faber just pointed out that you can receive mm -hmm. from the city. They were involved in the culvert replacement My understanding is when development touches the water, that's when the Fish and Wildlife Department is. Be involved? Not 
Well, you'd have to look at, again, it's all about the conditions, and here they have 28 conditions. Yeah. Um, some of them are ongoing conditions. There's a number of conditions that do address what occurs around the culvert itself and addresses materials and sediment and those kinds of issues are in there. So again, these are things you want to have in your kitchen drawer or somewhere where you can access them if something does not seem right. These are agencies that would get involved to make sure the conditions are complied with. Okay, I think we've done everything we needed to do today. More thing. One last thing, the, the letter from the Oh, let's take a look at that. I neglected to cover that. And what is that again that they want? Summarize. Uh, it's on the back. It's on page two. Um, additional semi evergreen or evergreen plants at the northwest corner to screen the driveway. And and or fence. And or fence. We 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 have we verbally agreed to them for this, but I think it didn't make it. Didn't make these are conditions from the 2008 or 2012. Decision, oh, but we're in not in this one. Right? But we're all in agreement to add them to this decision. We already had the and the corner they're talking about is not the very top corner. It's it's where the, where the driveway is. The driveway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we've already had it surveyed for them so that they know where it is. And they can do that. Okay. Thank you for catching that. It has a condition four and then a suggestion, right? So it's not. Well, it's not an actual condition, but it's a suggestion. suggestion. It's a suggestion. About the headlights you mentioned under the that. Headlights. Yeah. Yeah, if you, uh, the angle of the driveway closest to the house <coughs> would point headlights into their, into their windows. But it was the, typed on the, uh, power it was the least impactful. Since everyone agreed to it, we'll include that as part of the decision. There it is. And do you have a copy of the PowerPoint you can send to I me? I do, yes. It looks like there's four words missing, five, from what she sent in from the yes. National Commission, so I added those. Very careful review. Thank you for doing that. You're welcome. Save me from making an error. Okay, I'm going to close the record then on the hearing today. And based on all the testimony that I heard and the exhibits I reviewed, this will be approved and we'll do that within the next 10 working days. And we'll do it with the conditions that are recommended along with the modifications that we spoke to today. So there should be no surprises. If there are, if I do something wrong, there's an opportunity to raise reconsideration if there's some error in it. But I hope not. I hope that it's done correctly. I'll make all my best efforts to do that. And thank you for coming today. Thank you for your civility as neighbors. Uh, now, just before noon, we are adjourned. Thank you so and thank much. you, David Favor. It's good to see you in the hearing room again.